In Battle for Azeroth, players would go on many journeys for the raid experience, from raiding the titanic research facility of Uldar to the very home of the old gods and their minions themselves. Many of these bosses in these raids brought prestigious difficulty with them and would leave guilds to either disband entirely or never see the end of the tunnel. So much so, in fact, bosses on this list would reach such high attempts it would set records in terms of difficulty. To start off this list, we have the Fetid Devourer boss from Uldar, added with the launch of the Battle for Azeroth. Specifically, the mythic difficulty of this boss and its purpose was somewhat of a patchwork-style boss. Back in Nexoramus of either vanilla or Wrath of Lich King's versions, there was a boss named Patchwork. His entire gimmick was he had an incredibly large health bar and would do massive damage to the tanks who fought him, requiring a high management of defensive cooldowns, healers pocketing those same tanks, and DPS doing as much damage as possible before the boss reaches his relatively shortened rage timer and kills the tanks, and thus the group. This meant only that if he didn't have enough gear for the boss, you wouldn't kill him as his health was just too high without better gear. Fed to Devour would follow this same style of gameplay where he would require a large amount of item level and gear in order to meet the DPS check asked for. The fight itself was incredibly easy to understand for what the standard retail player had grown accustomed to during BFA, with only a small handful of mechanics to watch out for, making the fight roughly 6 minutes in total. The most important mechanic of this fight was Corruption Corpuscles. Basically, the fight's room would have the boss in the center, and there would be six divided sections where the corpuscles would spawn, one large one and two smaller versions of the same one. They wouldn't cause damage or give the boss any sort of buff for the time, but would begin a long cast called Inciting Essence. Should these adds get the cast off, it would beckon the boss to come forth and eat the ad on the floor and heal the boss for 30% of its health. If this were to happen, it's basically guaranteed a wipe because the boss would be much more able to reach its enrage timer and start killing the raid with its other mechanics much quicker. The problem with this, however, is that the DPS check this boss asked for in its position in the raid rivaled that of the mythic end boss Cahoon, which means the Devourer was horribly overtuned at the time. The health of the corpuscle adds was so high that being able to kill just one of the three was difficult for most groups and nearly assured the boss would receive its heal each time the ad showed up during the fight. Blizzard would nerf the fight within the first few days of the World First race, lowering the health of both the boss and the ads, allowing guilds from as high as the World First to more casual mythic raids to manage at least killing them with the gear they had by the end of the patch. After about 133 attempts, the guild Limit, now Liquid, would finally down the boss just hours after the health nerfs. However, even with the nerfs implemented in, when non-World First raiding guilds would reach the pseudo patchwork style boss fight, they would still be stuck on him for pretty considerable attempts, keeping true to the nature of the fight and acting as a true gear check for everyone. And at number 4, we have Lady Ashvane from the Eternal Palace raid released in patch 8.2. Ashvane would be the fourth boss of the new raid and would place herself right in the middle and act as a massive wall to mythic raiding guilds. Similar to the Fetid Devourer, Ashvane was extremely gear dependent, and asked many guilds that sought to clear as much of Mythic as possible to change strategies very often with things like gear progression. Ashvane, in terms of the World First race, didn't see much against the highest tier of raiders, only need about 37 attempts total in order to bring her down before progressing to the next boss, Orgozoa. Most notably, after the first week of Mythic, and by the third week, the kills had more than tripled as players had obtained the necessary loot. Ashvane herself was a mostly simple fight for the majority of the raiders, but required flawless execution in order to get her down. This would mean the progression curve of the fight would be incredibly steep, or a flat line depending on your guild at the time. The preface of the fight was that you would often tank her near the edge of the space and away from the mechanic, Coral Groats. These growths would remain throughout the fight and never move from their position until phase 2 would begin later on in the fight. There would also be rippling wave bubbles that needed to be soaked coming from the previous growths, but also staggered in order to not kill the raid and reach the boss, because if they did, it would restore percentage of the shield to Ashvane's health. Players would also be marked with the Bernie bubble, which would put a circle around a marked player of around 12 yards, and anyone within the bubble, including the marked player, would be incapacitated until someone helped kill the bubble you were stuck in. As you would progress phase 1, there would be more and more of the growths resulting in more rippling waves. The fight was split into two phases. Everything mentioned was phase 1, and the shield Ashvane had on herself, when broken, would begin phase 2. The boss now becomes vulnerable to damage and begins to gain energy over 70 seconds, occasionally damaging targets with an ability called Expose Azerite over time. Ashvane continues her mechanics from phase 1, but no longer spawns additional growths on the ground or rippling waves. The new main gimmick was to use her phase 2 ability called Arcane Azerite to remove the growths on the floor to free up space and cause less mechanics. She will cast this twice per phase, and the raid typically aims to clear every growth during this time. When the boss reaches 100 energy, she will regain her shield, but now at a much stronger amount, and will repeat the mechanics from phase 1 until defeated. 
Ideally, your raid would assign players to soak the bubbles to keep the boss from gaining her shields, and all DPS players would need to learn the position of the boss with the tanks in order to clear the corals effectively. Now, Ashvane is brought to this list because, despite the really high end mythic raid gill seemingly having no problem with her, this boss was known in BFA to be an infamous guild killer. Players could spend hundreds of attempts on this boss and only being halfway through the raid would bring motivation levels to the floor and many would quit altogether. The fight would also demand a third tank usually, depending on your composition, and many more casual guilds just didn't have the players willing or numbers to accommodate for this task. Ashvane would receive lots of tuning and fixes to her fight as she'd continue on, eventually resulting in more kills. These nerfs can vary from lowering Ashvane's health and the damage from her main mechanics multiple times before guilds would kill her. According to Warcraft logs, kills on Ashvane dropped dramatically in comparison to the bosses prior to Ashvane, and even further when reaching Orgozoa, creating an environment where the middle of Eternal Palace would stump many guilds in BFA, rather than the last two. And at number 3, we have Jaina Proudmoore from the Battle for Dazara lore raid added in patch 8.1. Coming in at around 346 attempts for the world first by method, Jaina would become infamous for her guild killer environment and grossly large attempt counts. Battle for Dazara lore came with a flavor of changing your faction mid-raid. Depending what you played at the time, the Horde would stay the same during Jaina's encounter, and the Alliance would be changed to the Horde races in order to stay on theme with the faction war aesthetic the expansion had going. Jaina's fight was a long three-phase encounter with two intermissions. Jaina's wipe count wouldn't be in the most obscene range players had seen before for men bosses and raids, and she was relatively well received for the tuning at the time. The general abilities of the fight as you would progress throughout it were mechanics that would freeze or stun your characters in place permanently unless your group helped you. This means you could get stuck in hard to reach locations while the encounter's many mechanics were going on, and you may never actually get the help you needed and just die. There was also a mechanic called Chilling Touch, which you had to manage throughout the fight to make sure it didn't get to 20 stacks, where if it did, it would stun you. However, there was a bit of an oversight with this mechanic, as it was technically counted as a slow. This led many high-end raiding guilds to swap their characters to the troll race, as they had a racial called De Voodoo Shuffle, which would reduce movement slowing effects by 20%. This would actually allow the Chilling Touch debuff to just fall off after intermission phase 2, so you could start phase 3 with 0 stacks. And this slight boost was just good enough that all of the World First Guild races changed their races to trolls just to cheese this mechanic. You don't see this happen very often in fights, but another example of this happening was during the Stone Legion encounter in Shadowlands, where everyone would swap their characters to either Dwarf or Dark Iron Dwarf to remove the Deadly Bleed effect from the fight with their respective stone form racials. It's never completely necessary to follow these strategies to obtain the kill you're going for, even if it's cutting edge. But for a guild to even consider following this act for just the smallest boost really shows how unique a fight it can be. Not to mention the fight was quite a long one, clocking it at 8 to 9 minutes long. This means that even the smallest misstep can result in a complete do-over. The Jaina fight was enjoyed by many and rewarded devoted players with the Glacial Tidestorm mount when defeated. However, her kills compared to the boss just before her show a staggering decline, as hundreds of attempts would be sunk into her and get nowhere close to defeat. Following the Warcraft logs of the time, Jaina had received about 1,700 total kills before the release of the next tier. In comparison, just over 500 would kill the Stonewall blockade, marking over two-thirds of the guilds progressing Jaina unsuccessful. Eventually, however, towards the end of BFA's inception, a skip would be added and with players geared with loot pertaining to 8.3, she could be semi-cheese as players discovered that with the massive uptake in gear and survivability, if you simply just didn't interrupt her cast during the first intermission, you could stack the entire raid and burn her down on the spot. Though, even with this addition, mainly so players could farm her mount during the current content, large amounts of players would fall short in getting her down completely and never receive the coveted elemental mount. Even at the time of writing the script in Dragonflight, it's impossible to solo her as your character would freeze without the warmth needed from other players. And at number 2, we have Queen Ajara, the end boss of the Eternal Palace added in patch 8.2. Following Ajvain in her footsteps, this boss was much more demanding in its mechanics and gear checks overall. Understandably, this was an end boss and was to be expected by anyone, but the dramatic fall off in total kills by guilds was not only very large, but the fight is heralded as one of the worst end bosses by many high end raiders of all time. This encounter was split into four phases and two intermissions. During phase one, you wouldn't even fight Ajar herself, but two mini bosses. They weren't incredibly difficult, and required some line of sight mechanics and keeping away from most players to avoid being hit with the abilities such as Chain Lightning and Charge Spear. Occasionally, as would also spawn, which needed to be crowd controlled and killed as soon as possible. Once the first phase was complete, the first intermission would begin where Ajara would task every player with a very unique task that required perfect execution. These could vary between soaking orbs, not soaking orbs, standing with other players, or running constantly away from players. 
Failing to do these would result in a nasty dot depending on how many tasks were failed. Once completed, phase 2 would begin and you would begin to fight Ajar herself. Now, the fight had a major mechanic that overhauled any phase of the boss fight called Ancient Wards. In three sections of the encounter space, there would be consoles players would interact with by standing on and forcing its energy to replenish. Standing on these would give you a stacking debuff of Drain Soul, which would reduce your maximum health by 10% per stack. There is also a new ward added in phase 2 in the center of the platform, which players need to actively not let become charged. Standing on the platform will sap its energy away and apply the same Drain Soul debuff. If all three wards should power down, it will result in an instant wipe of the raid. Occasionally, the boss will beckon you, mind control you and possibly walking your character over bad zones of AoE, or draining more of your health over the wards. Ads will also spawn throughout the encounter and attempt at empowering the ward of power in the center of the room. The second intermission soon begins, and you will be tasked with similar tasks as the first intermission, but you can still damage Ajara here. Phase 3 begins and more ads spawn to attempt at draining the wards of their energy to wipe the raid. Many of these ads have mechanics that interact with each other such as Crystalline Shield on the Tide Mistress being broken by the Charged Spear mechanic from Phase 1. Eventually, Phase 4 begins and no more ads will spawn at this point, and she will attempt to kill the group herself with many more mechanics, such as Nether Portal, a very deadly AoE circle. The Titan console that was used at the beginning to begin the fight is now interactable, and Ajara will attempt to drain every ward all at once unless the console is used to stop this, creating large amounts of raid damage in controlled space. To create an image of how much this fight required, it managed to topple Jaina in terms of attempts, and Guild stuck in her progression as the mechanics of interacting with wars and titan consoles was so foreign to players, it invigorated a massive learning curve to everyone at every skill level involved. At about 359 attempts, Queen Ajar would eventually be defeated by Method, soon followed by Limit and Alpha. Unfortunately for most, they would never receive their cutting edge achievements when it came to Ajara, as she was generally heralded as super unfun to players, because the ward mechanic would force players to just stop DPSing entirely, and play in an incredibly strange method. And at number 1, we have Unat, Harbringer of the Void, from the Raid Crucible of Storms in patch 8.1.5. Unat was an incredibly complex boss, and his difficulty was beyond anything Ryutel players had seen in a long time. Crucible of Storms was only a 2 boss raid instance, and Unat would serve as the final boss. The general gimmick of the fight is there would be multiple relics players could retrieve from killing the trash just before Unat himself. These relics would be crucial to counter and defending off against the fight style. Using each relic would bring with it a positive effect to help aid your raid, but because they are relics of the void, they also come with a marked downside. For example, if you picked up the void stone as a healer and used it, it will give you a damage shield and cause all enemies to receive 100% less healing. However, when doing so, you will also receive 100% less healing, meaning anything you try to do to keep yourself alive with this active was ultimately worthless, and force the player into good timings and more rounded thoughts. In Phase 1, there was a mechanic called Unstable Resonance that would mark every single player with a mark corresponding to the three relics that were picked up from before. You had 12 seconds to run to the player with your matching relic before it would explode and deal lethal damage to your entire raid. Also, if you ran through any other player of the opposite mark as your own, it would trigger this damage as if you failed to meet the timer and kill you immediately. This mechanic alone upon Unot's release would cause hundreds of wipes, as while fighting all the boss's other various Phase 1 mechanics, they would often overlap and force players into incredibly uncomfortable scenarios and trigger the explosion far too quickly and wipe the raid. So eventually, Blizzard would change the ability's timers and allow players an extra 3 seconds to find their target in time before the explosion occurred. Before this nerf, most guilds had more wipes than either Jaina or Ajar already, with the final kill count of the world first kill being over 700. During the final phase of the encounter, the boss would begin to cast an ability called Insatiable Torment. Basically, what this debuff did is it would mark a player with a hazardous red circle, and they could no longer receive any healing to their character unless it was their own. Or they stood on friendly players, and the red circle would steal their health and give it to them in order to heal them. This meant that out of only the 151 guilds that killed this boss, they would bring as many warlocks as possible to the raid. Warlocks could almost negate this mechanic entirely by casting Drain Life, and their passive Soul Leech, which would reduce the damage the raid received altogether. This created a strategy where the guild would only run 3 healers and 14 ranged DPS. Most of the time half or even more of those ranged DPS were Affliction Warlocks, as Siphon Life would be an additional healing spell to counter the Insatiable Torment spell. What makes this fight so infamous was not only were its mechanics so insanely demanding and overtuned during the first few weeks of release, but it holds the record of the most wipes ever on a boss in all of WoW before the first kill. 
It wouldn't share the record of going the longest unkilled, but the sheer amount of wipes guilds faced before a world first was achieved was staggering. Pieces would eventually come out on top after an insane 731 wipes to a knot alone. To add further difficulty, the fight was also very long, typically over 10 minutes, and players were able to lust twice per fight. This means that if you got the boss to about 10% health after 8 to 9 minutes of combat and wiped, you would need to start all over again. But Knot would receive many nerfs to the fight, and understandably so, after seeing the mountains of bodies he created. Though, because this raid was a mini raid and was released technically during the same raid tier as Battle for Dazara lore, Blizzard went about tuning the raid much harder because the expected guilds who had already cleared BOD and gotten the best mythic loot from it would need to be challenged in order to not clear the raid in only a few days or less. Because so little guilds had actually killed this boss when it was current, from its difficulty and the fact that loot just wasn't that great of an upgrade for most classes since it was so close to BOD's item level, many servers, even during patches 8.2 and 8.3, would receive Realm First achievements when they went back to attempt the raid of Mythic difficulty. This meant, even with the inclusion of Azerite Essences from 8.2 and Corruptions from 8.3, Unot on some realms still was not defeated during BFA. For Unat's time, he has become one of the most difficult bosses in not just BFA, but in all of WoW's history, continuing to hold the record of the most wipes ever, even in Dragonflight. Alright, and that's all of them. BFA was mostly known for its arguably failed Azerite system, but more importantly how challenging its raids were. Even in mid-tiers, walls were present that many guilds just couldn't overcome. Now, were there any bosses you think should have made this list? If so, I'd love to hear your thoughts down in the comments, as well as ideas for future videos just like this one.